Hey everyone, so this is going to be my quick rundown video of quote analysis, quote um, citation, and image analysis. So a, a lot of you sort of fell into a bad zone of paraphrase and also of opinion commenting, right? Um, so if we think about analysis, the key to remember is that this is not really opinion. So if you're using pronouns like I, we, da 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 da, I believe, I think, I, all of that moves you into the realm of opinion. And that's not good analysis. The reason it's not good analysis is because technically um, your opinion doesn't matter in analysis, right? So you should be eliminating if you're doing an analytical paper. All of that I, me, you think we us all that stuff that you're adding in uh ditch it it's not helping you and it's actually weakening your position because then someone can just look at it and say it's opinion so whatever it is you state state it as fact state it straight up don't add any sort of couching to it don't add any like maybe possibly any of that stuff will weaken your position right so now that we've done that really quickly, um, we have to talk about analysis itself. A lot of what I see on these papers is a um, like a a rephrasing or a redescription of what we had in the book, and that may help you to sort of cement it in your mind, but it's not giving me anything think about. It's not giving me anything to go off of, right? So if we're going to have all of this and think about it in terms of analysis, we can't just be restating what's been said in the book. So here we go. I'm going to take something that a lot of you used, one of the quotes that a lot of you used, which is uh, Dr. Manhattan talking to Lori. And he says at one point to her, we're all puppets, Lori. I'm just a puppet who can see the string. Now, that's a really easy thing to look at and say, oh, Manhattan sees sort of the future and the past and blah, 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 and restate it over and over and over again. The question that I'm leaving you with is what does Manhattan really mean? What is it that Manhattan is saying? And if we think about that, in depth, we're all puppets. I'm just a puppet who can see the strings. That implies something, and the implication is some form of puppet master, someone who's controlling what John does, right? He never specifically states that there is a God, or that he believes in God. A lot of people talk about John as though he is God, but if he's a puppet, what is controlling him? That is a piece of analysis, right? That takes it into another step, a step further than what we see on the page. So let's keep thinking about that. If John knows that there is a higher being than him, it's kind of weird that at the end, John decides that he is going to go off and create life and function as God, right? And there's a lot of discussion about whether or not he is God throughout the book. Like when we see John talking, uh, or when there's that conversation about John versus theology and the, um, the people of Vietnam, that they weren't willing to surrender to America, but they were willing to send, surrender to John specifically because he was in their view, God, right? And he talks about sort of his loss of humanity and his step beyond humanity, but he never says that he is an ultimate power. And there are indicators of that throughout, which are the fact that Adrian can block his vision of the future. If a simple man can step in and prevent 
God from doing something? A God who is supposed to be all powerful? Is that God? Right? And all of these things build into it. The other thing that you might want to consider is that if John is talking about not being God or being God, he's also talking about physics, right? We're all puppets, Lord, but I'm a puppet who can see the strings. It's very possible that John is talking about string theory, right? How um, the universe is structured and how the universe works. And that in his higher state of being, that he understands that at a deeper level than anyone else. Okay, so now that we've done a little bit of quote analysis, I want you to notice something. I never said in my quote analysis that Alan Moore does XYZ thing or Alan Moore says X, Y, Z thing via John, right? And the reason why I never say that is because that implies authorial intent, which means basically that you are saying that this is what Alan Moore meant to say. And the only way that we can make that claim is if we actually have Alan Moore on record saying that that was what he meant to say, right? So any sort of analysis that you do is essentially interpretation of what's placed on the page. We can't necessarily attribute that interpretation to Alan Moore because we don't know definitively whether or not that's what he meant. And it gets even more complex because what if Alan Moore were dead? Like say, Mary Shelley, and you're reading Frankenstein and you say, Mary Shelley meant this. Well, if Mary Shelley meant that, then she must have said that she meant that somewhere at some point, and it must be on record. If she didn't say that particular thing, then you're attributing something to her that she may not have meant, right? So think about that and make sure that if you're attributing something, that you actually are 100% sure and have record of it. And if you do, you should be quoting, right? It should be a direct quote from Alan Moore that says, hey, I meant this, blah, 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 blah. So we've got to avoid authorial intent. What we're doing is pulling out what we see on the page, right? And this is part of analysis. So let's step to the next thing. I want to step to image. Now, you guys have seen this, right? You've seen my tattoo. And obviously when I show it to you, it's, um, it's upside down most of the time. But there it is right side up. And we know that that is John Osterman's little tattoo image, right? But if you think about it, it's more than that. Because if you look at it, essentially what we have is a clock. And the clock is indicating midnight, right? 12 o'clock. Well, isn't midnight the end of civilization according to the uh, countdown clock. On top of that, this image also mimics comedian's badge. So let's open up to the, uh, the comedian's badge. There it is. And we have yet another marking of a space on a circle, but it's not midnight. It's just off of midnight. So with the blood mark, right? And all of that imagery is repeated clock imagery throughout the book. The fact that the book is titled Watchmen, which has a dual meaning. It's either the men who watch, or it is watches. I mean, even on the cover, look, there's a clock. So we have that image again, the circular clock. John Osterman, Dr. Manhattan, the son of a watchmaker and a watch repairer. And that gets cycled around. You know what else is cyclical? The book itself. So if we open to the front page, right? Let me pull us there. We open on the smiley face pin. If we open to the back page, we close on the smiley face. And it cycles us back around to the front. So the book itself is cyclical. I hope you're all following this. 
This book is really heavily about cycles. When John shows up on Mars, we get this sort of repeated, this, this clockwork imagery in the space that he makes for himself to live. It's like a torn apart, flipped upside down clock with cogs in it and things like that. And it looks like a cross between an actual clock and also an hourglass. And time ticks by, and time ticks by, and time ticks by. The other thing is that we can say about this, um, obviously it's a hydrogen molecule, right? And we know that hydrogen is the base of a hydrogen bomb. And we know that John has nuclear power and on and on and on and on and on. So that is image analysis. We look at the imagery and we determine what it is that imagery means. And we can go even more in depth. I mean, we went over uh, costuming in class and what that imagery meant. But let me find something else for you. The second or the... La, 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 la. I'm getting there. Sorry, guys. We marked this. So there's an issue in this called fearful symmetry, right? And here it is. Chapter five is fearful symmetry. And if we're looking at chapter five, there's something that you need to note, which is that chapter five from front to back has symmetrical panel and color layout, right? And we can keep doing this from page to page. So if I open it like this, you see these two are symmetrical. It's interesting though that chapter five is the symmetrical point because true symmetry in the book is the center of the book. This is also an issue that focuses widely on Rorschach is supposed to be symmetrical, right? But when we get to the center of this lovely book, this after, there's something that's really important. So we're moving, we're moving. Here's the center. And this is the battle that Adrian has for the, against the person who is supposedly trying to kill him, whom he actually hires and then kills. And frame this as like a, an attempted murder-suicide. If you notice the body shape in the center between Adrian, the V in the background, and the guy falling down, it makes a giant X, which is really as X marks the spot. And we're showing us the villain of the book in fearful symmetry. And this is the very center of this issue. Right? So that is some more of that. Now, there are some other things going on. A lot of you tried valiantly to properly cite your work. However, you failed. Um, and the reason you failed is possibly because you didn't look up how to cite it, possibly, whatever it may be, right? But we've got to at least try to get it right. So I'm going to show you one form of citation, which is the citation I prefer, and that's MLA format. So if we're MLA format, what we do is we make our quote or we put in our image and we put an intextual parenthetical citation. And in the case of Watchmen, there are two ways you could really do this. Um, one, because of comic books and the way they're structured, it can be hard and they are a little bit hard to count pages. Like they don't always show you the pages, so you would have to count. If that's the case, you could do something like this. More, issue one, page 22. If, however, it does have the pages and it's easy to figure out what it is, your parenthetical should be more, the last name, and then the page, 121. That's really easy, right? If you're doing, say, a play, you would have Marlowe, act two, scene three, lines 26 through 35. If you're doing a poem by Percy Bysshe Shelley, Shelley, lines 26 through 32, and they should always go right after the quotation or the image so that we know what we're looking at. And this right here, Moore or Shelley or Cohen, that tells me to go to your works cited page and look at Moore 
to find out what book you used. Oh, 120. 120, 31. This is a movie by the Coen brothers, and that is what we call an I'm stamp. So if you're going to write next to me, which you are, on Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, you will absolutely have to do a timestamp. If you just give me Cohen as your citation and no timestamp, you have failed proper citation. And the reason you failed proper citation is that while you have indicated to me that it was by the Cohen brothers, which will match in your work cited, you have not indicated to me anywhere in the movie as to where it fits right? And where it sits. So that means that I have to sit down and watch the whole darn movie to find your citation. And that's not how it's done. Um, and the reason that's not how it's done is because then you're making things way, way, way too complex on the person reading your work, right? On top of that, it should be easy to follow the text backward. So I have to read every book that find out what you're talking about, you're not doing proper citation. Work cited pages, real easy. Work cited pages contain the works that you cite in your paper. Yes? So if you're doing a work cited, it should be in alphabetical order. Because if it's out of alphabetical order, I may go looking for something and not find it immediately and say, oh, you didn't cite it properly. You didn't have it in your work cited. And what I mean by works cited in your paper, that means that if you quote from it, or you put an image from it, or you put a graph from it, that needs to be in your work cited, right? The citation itself is also really easy. If you go to the MLA website, you can go to a styles guide help, and it will tell you the breakdown of works cited. When I was your age, it was really hard, and they had a book, and you had to look up every single different type of citation. If it was a movie, it was different from if it was a book, it was different from if it was a play, blah, 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 blah. Now it's all the same format, right? And you go there, and it lists the order of things. So, boom, right down the line. In this case, since it's this Watchmen book that I'm doing, it would be unindented, more, comma, Allen, period. Watchmen italicized, period. Then I'm adding extra people who um, contributed to the work, Dave Gibbons, comma, publisher, DC Comics, comma, year 1982, comma, New York, comma, which is city, New York, comma, state, and sorry, after New York state, you hit a period, and that's it. That's everything I need to know to find this book. The reason we do this is because some books have multiple versions of them. If you were to, say, be doing in this class, do Android Dream of Electric Sheep, there are several different ways that you can get this book in several different publication formats. So I need to know what publication format you have, so that I have the right pagination, which means that the page here that you cite matches the page in the book that I'm looking at. Because if the pagination is wrong, once again, I can't trace back what you're doing. And that's everything that citation is about. You should be able to trace. All right, that was sort of my quick, hard look at citation and all that stuff. Sorry, I said it was going to be 15 minutes. It's closer to 20, but you needed all that information. So enjoy Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse this weekend, and I will see you all on Monday. Um, directions for today's piece, by the way, before you take off. This is what I want you to do. I want you to comment specifically looking at the analysis of the image and of the quote. This is what we call unpacking, right? You have something, it's packed full of information, you've got to take it out. So comment on each one about each thing, right? Not necessarily a pro and con, but one comment on their image and one comment on their quote, and that'll be your first comment section. And then I want you to comment on one other person's comment for each one. So 
So again, it's sort of four things, right? A comment on the image, a comment on the quote, and then a comment on someone else for each one. Um, I'll see you guys on Monday. Usual stands, 5 p.m. Friday for the uh, end of this. Talk to you guys later.